I would be discussing my current research as well as my past experiences and research because of which I am at the moment at my current position. So today's research uh, topic which I've chosen to discuss is nutrition and metabolic diseases when it is too much and or uh, too little. So my current research is mainly in the area of translational medicine with a key focus on obesity and obesity mediated metabolic disorders. I am particularly interested in understanding the causes and novel mechanisms of metabolic diseases so that we can find new drug targets against these disorders. In that respect, I'm studying mechanisms which lead to insulin resistance in adipose tissue and also the cell organelle dysfunctions, which are one of the primary causes for inducing these insulin resistance in adipocytes. When we talk of obesity and metabolism, many of you might have heard about metabolic syndrome. Metabolic syndrome is the name basically given to a group of health problems which lead to higher risk of diseases of the heart and blood vessels, such as heart attacks, strokes, and any other cardiovascular disease. It's a very common disorder, and one in four adults in UK are thought to have some kind of metabolic syndrome. The risk factors which cause metabolic syndrome primarily is the, one of the biggest one is the obesity or being overweight. And the one is insulin resistance or high blood pressure. And one of the main causes are having uh, sleep, poor sleep, stress, among many factors. So I would like to discuss what happened to us and where did we go wrong? It has taken 5 million years for us to become Homo sapiens and around 200,000 years to become Homo sapiens from Neanderthals. But if you look back, our diet has been consistent for mostly even before 100 years ago. But in past 100 years, all of us can visualize the changes our nutrition, our diet and eating habits have taken. Not only just diet, it's also our lifestyle. If you think, if I remember in my childhood, my dad used to cycle to work few uh, around five, six miles every day. And five, six kilometers going to school was common by walk. Now I have my kids. It's two kilometers away, the school, and they will wait at the door to be dropped off. So there are various changes which we are have taken over, but we haven't adopted the diet accordingly or the nutrition which we get. If you think in 1960 in the Western world, only 1% of males were obese and 2% female. Then it increased to 25% and uh, men and 27% females in just a few decades. And by 2050, we are predicted that more than half our population will be obese. So you can understand the amount of uh, challenge we are facing and the amount, many diseases, there is increase in cancer, there is increase in metabolic diseases, uh, cardiovascular diseases, uh, you, you, you can name it. Since we are talking about evolution, my research it also has evolved with time. I started as a microbiologist or uh, using molecular biology techniques in fungi. So my first project was under Professor Punekar at IIT Bombay, where we were studying Aspergillus niger. Aspergillus niger is the common fungus which you will see. First thing when you notice a stale bread as a black spot or a uh, dark green growth. You can also find them on onions, the black shades, which you say when it sporulates. 
So it does look very pretty under an electron microscope, but it smells disgusting. And one of the reasons we were studying actually is to look at its industrial potential. It is used for the production of citric acid as gluconic acid industrially. And the pathway which I was investigating was role of AMP deaminase in that uh, respect. But to take you back, AMP deaminase is one of the targets for metformin. Metformin is the first line drug which is given to type 2 diabetics. Obviously, I didn't know it at that time, but it is given so that it can stop this reaction and so that there is a huge accumulation of adenosine monophosphate, which can then be converted into ATP. From there, I received a fellowship from Council of Scientific and Industrial Research after an entrance exam, which funded me for next five years. And then it gave me opportunity to choose institute and supervisor wherever I wanted to work. So at that time, I was, for some reason, interested in bamboo. Uh, and bamboo plants, why? Because I saw a paper that they have a team in National Chemical Laboratory, Pune, have managed to flower them in a petri dish or test tube. Why it is interesting is bamboo actually flowers only once in a lifetime, and that too between 60 to 120 years. So it looked like a massive achievement, and that's why specific varieties of bamboo propagation is a challenge, and is still to date. So armed with my fellowship, I visited National Chemical Laboratory in Pune. Unfortunately, I could not meet Dr. Muskerenhaus, who led the project. But then I started looking around, working with other teams. And one of the teams, which were again in plant tissue culture, the rest of the teams were working on plants. Dr. S. K. Rawal, he said, oh, I have got an interesting project and I have got some money to investigate biodegradable biopolymers. I said, what's so interesting about that? He said, this polymer actually has exact, very similar functions to polyethylene, and it can replace polyethylene. And we can overproduce it, and then the pathway matches with the fatty acid or lipid pathway within plants. So think if we can start producing this polymer in plants. So I went back, looked at few publications, and I thought, actually, it does make sense, and it looks like a very interesting topic. And it may change the world, the way we look at it. But anyway, 20 years, 20 year on, we are still at the same stage. So what happens, this is the all the research fellows at that time when I was doing PhD. So I said, which organism to look at? So he said, alkali genes that accumulates around 50% of the dry cell weight. I said, but that's patented, so we can't really uh, work on it. So uh, there is a national collection, uh, collection of industrial microorganisms within NCL. So I went and visited the microbiology department and came back with six, seven varieties. Here I am uh, culturing those uh, cells on a petri dish and looking at which ones to select. After southern blotting and a lot of numerous trials, I found one organism, the Streptomyces oreophasians, which is an actinomycete. And my first challenge was isolating DNA from it because it forms a very weird layer around it, similar to plants, and we did not have any protocols available. So I merged the bacterial isolation protocol with the plant isolation protocol and published it actually. It is it's still one of very highly cited papers, which was just submitted as a small paper. So I isolated DNA from that and then he started investigating the pathway for the polyhydroxy alkanates. Uh, and the, there were three genes which were involved in the synthesis of it. One is 3-ketothiolase, esterostyl reductase, and PHA synthase. So first two are usually found 
in most of the organisms, including us, because they are part of the TCA and Krebs cycle, is the PHA synthase, which is the novel enzyme here. So after I created a genomic library from its DNA into E. coli, and then initial screening gave me more than, I think, 300 clones or something like that. And then step by step, I had to isolate the clones for each gene. At the end, I ended up with just two. And I named it after myself, PGTSA 067 and PGTSA 240, because they contained all the three genes. And to my surprise, when I cultured them and looked under fluorescence microscope after staining, they just glowed beautifully. These recombinant E. coli was accumulating so much polyhydroxyalkanates, I could not believe it at the first instance. And I got lucky there. The lucky because these three genes were a, located in tandem, one after another, in a 4.5 kilo base pair of DNA. And that was a, the biggest fluke of my life, actually. So another thing was, if you changed the carbon source or the nitrogen source within this polymer, it tends to not only changes growth rate, it also changes the property of the polymer which is produced. So you can produce polyhydroxybutyrate, polyhydroxybutyrate valerate, polyhydroxyalkanoate, and each polymer gives its own property. Some are brittle, some are elastic, some have more piezoelectricity, so they are can be used as uh, bone implants. So the, its use is enormous if exploited. This is how it looks uh, under electron microscope. The next challenge was to sequence the 4.5 kilo base pair. And believe it or not, this is the old fashioned sequencing. It was almost a one meter long acrylamide gel electrophoresis. And every time you do it, even a single bubble can destroy your whole thing. And so for everything, you have to sequence it using S35, which is a radioactive. So you have to pour the gel, do the radioactive reaction, remove the top gel, uh, plate, and then dry it, and then carry it around after drying and put extra film in a dark room. So if you get it, so maximum one read will give you around 200 bases. And everything you, with a ruler you have to sit and you have to really uh, feed somebody, treat them well so that they sit next to you to write all the sequences. So that took me like three, four months of my nights and days. So if you think in today's time, it will probably take a couple of days by a commercial company. If you compare, say, with Human Genome Project, Human Genome Project total expenditure worldwide was $2.7 billion. And same level of sequencing is suppose I want to get it done now, a draft sequence will cost me just under $1,000. And I'll get it done in a few days. So that's the challenge. So technology does uh, improve quite a lot. And from there, then I started looking for a postdoctoral fellowship. And one of the advantages of working in a good institute was that we always have a stream of good uh, speakers. And Professor Al Brown had visited National Chemical Laboratory once and uh, presented a seminar. After his seminar, I had a chat and uh, he said, OK, so I thought that he would have forgotten. But when the time came, I sent an email, said, uh, I am just starting, thinking to start writing my thesis. Would you have any positions available? He said, oh, it's a good timing. I've just acquired a BBSRC grant, and in a couple of weeks, I've been interviewing people. And so would you be ready to give an interview in a couple of weeks? What's your phone number? So I gave his phone, uh, phone number and I was interviewed on the phone in my PhD supervisor's house. 
so he was next door listening to me <laughs> at the end of the interview i said look so far whoever i have offered the position they have never refused i said that's great but what does that mean he said if i offer you can you would you accept it i said great i haven't applied anywhere else so that's fine so and i knew about his work as well so i was quite uh, pleased and he said the latest uh, you can delay is march 2000 march 99 and that was november 99 1998 i said god i have to write my thesis defense and everything has to be done in that time so anyway it all worked out fine and by 23rd march 99 i was in his lab and this is his lab he had like eight nine postdocs and each postdocs were given few phd students to supervise to not only work on their project but work on other projects as well he used to work on uh, pathogen candida albicans and the project we were investigating was looking at gcn4 gcn4 how it coordinates morphogenesis uh, transcription as uh, in candida albicans morphogenesis is very important because for candida albicans to become pathogenic it has to move from yeast form to hyphal form that's why this was being investigated as one of the drug targets if you think gcn4 actually uh, regulates nitrogen metabolism within uh, candida or yeast including humans uh, and uh, isoform of it is called eif2 alpha so if you imagine a normal gene looks like this there is a promoter various other elemental binding sites and the gene and then it's transcribed from here to here as the open reading frame so what's so different about gcn4 how does it senses the nitrogen deficiency the way it senses it it has got not one open reading frame but four open reading frames at top of uh, with the promoter so when the rna is synthesized it has got all the four so when the transcription uh, when the translation starts the protein synthesis what happens the first one is recognized and then terminated so the methionine which is the first amino acid to be added is unavailable here so that means there is a uh, a uh, 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 lot of nitrogen because it will start here stop here start here stop here but by the time it will reach here there won't be any methionine available so it will not uh, initiate but when there is a deficiency it will start here stop here but methionine won't be available for one of these but it does become available at this gcn4 that's how it senses it some of this research are now textbook materials actually so what we did was to investigate whether gcn4 is activated or not we uh, knocked out gcn4 from candida albicans and you can see as you uh, this is the heterozygous one and this is the homozygous one it has got the full two gcn4 genes it has got just one and then there is reduction uh, there is still filamentous formation when you starve it with amino acids but then if you knock out the whole gcn4 even if you starve or whatever you do it does not transform into hyphal form so it becomes totally non pathogenic so this was the research uh, which i carried out at uh, 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 aberdeen university as my first project and this is the pathway so it which is its main role is to synthesize and regulate amino acid biosynthesis and these are some of the amino acid biosynthesis which are not synthesized when it's knocked out yet but its additional role is also to regulate morphogenesis where the yeast gets converted to hyphal form after this project i was getting interested into getting more mainstream into mammalian research and i spoke to al he said i have got another project coming which i helped write actually and was successful he said you can continue on this one i said but my heart is set on moving into mammalian research and as a postdoc when you want to move into mammalian research from one system to another it is 
quite challenging because people expect you to come experienced. Anyway, I applied to Cambridge and I wasn't expecting to get even an interview here. And so Jenny, to her full, uh, I, I don't know what she saw in my CV because at that time, all my papers were also in writing. They were not published. So she gave me the opportunity and she was investigating myogenesis, specifically the role of insulin uh, growth factor, insulin-like growth factor, IGF-1, and the binding proteins and their role in myogenesis. So the muscle is quite interesting, the skeletal muscles. They, all the skeletal muscle have satellite cells on uh, embedded in them. They are more like stem cells. So when the muscle gets injured, some of these pathways get triggered to uh, heal the injury. And that's where the myogenesis process happens. And these binding proteins and IGF plays an important role. So that was the premise of the project. So these are the binding proteins. There are around seven. Depending on the tissue type, a different one is uh, uh, synthesized in each individual tissue. And they, IGF-1 has got huge role in cellular proliferation, cell division, and also metabolism. So it needs to be regulated very tightly. And that's why these IGF binding proteins are there to regulate its level within the circulation. But what happens, we were also interested in finding these IGF binding proteins, do they just regulate IGF or they do some other functions which is independent of IGF? Because the number of uh, proteins we have got is quite limited. So we were investigated. So what we did was we made transgenic mice where we had two types of transgenic mice. One which synthesized the wild type form of uh, binding protein 5, which is specifically expressed in uh, muscle and other metabolic uh, tissues. Then another transgenic mice we created, which has we have mutated the binding site of the IGF. So it is free circulating VP5, which doesn't bind to IGF. So it is not regulating IGF. So IGF is freely look, uh, circulating as well. So what we expected that, yes, these mice will be smaller with the wild type form of IGF VP5, but when we mutate the IGF1 and IGF is really free, the, those mice may get larger than even the control. But to our surprise, actually, they, even the mutated IGF BP5 also had, was the same size and was growth retarded, same as the wild type mutated 5. And that gave us the reason to believe that BP5 has IGF independent function as well. So we further investigated its role in myogenesis, how myotypes are formed, and how uh, it can play a role in cancer and other stuff. It, it was a highly successful uh, period in my career in the terms of uh, 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 research outputs. We published around six papers in just little over uh, three years time. From there, then I moved to actual Cambridge University campus uh, next to the Adam Brooks Hospital on a Leukemia Research Foundation Fellowship for five years. And I started doing work on uh, 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 transcription factors which induce uh, erythropoiesis or cell blood, uh, blood formation. Uh, but what happened, we were still working on mice and the way we were investigating was the transcription factor, how this is regulated, uh, from five kilo basis down or upstream or downstream. And that did not give me enough satisfaction. I said, it's, it's never going to launch or take off as a drug or anything. So I saw this thing. Then I went to Warwick University and met uh, uh, Professor Sudesh Kumar. Uh, I say, I showed my interest and uh, they wanted RCUK Academic Fellowship they have acquired and they wanted to advertise it. Uh, so I spoke to him and uh, to my surprise when he invited me, I thought it was my interview. <laughs> but it was just to show the facility and walk me around. 
and they haven't even shortlisted it. To anyway, I got shortlisted, and from there on, I was made uh, assistant prof. Uh, as well as RCUK Academic Fellow. And I was given the opportunity to form my own research team. And that's where all started. In And I formed very good relationship with uh, Dr. Philip McTurn. And now he's a professor at uh, Nottingham Trent University and head of biosciences. Uh, this is our team. Uh, we used to work closely together on several projects. So in addition to doing research, we also used to have fun sometimes. This is uh, myself, I doing a skydiving for charity for Diabetes UK. Jumping from 13,000 feet was quite, yeah, you can imagine. Uh, but I would do it again if I had the opportunity. So there, we, everybody in the team was working on adipose tissue and I had no experience in adipose tissue. I has come from a skeletal muscle background uh, and uh, murine models. Here we were using human adipose tissue, uh, getting uh, adipose tissue from uh, plastic surgery units or uh, you can call it uh, liposuction units uh, uh, from Birmingham and uh, places like that. So at first, I was given full opportunity to continue doing what I was doing at Cambridge at Babraham. Uh, then I looked at the resources and I came across a huge resource, which was uh, they had a huge collection of not only just adipose tissue, but also adipose derived stem cells or stromal vascular fractions. So. Adipose tissue is quite interesting in terms, for a long time, it was seen as a very sedentary organ which just accumulates lipid. And if you see, there are various depots. It's not just located at one side like a liver or any other organ. You can find adipose tissue at, at, tissue at various places and that's how it gets its name, where it is located. You have subcutaneous, which is just beneath the skin, uh, an abdominal region and subcutaneous in gluteal uh, femoral region. You also have a visceral adipose tissue, which is embedded between the organs, or also known as omental adipose tissue. You have epicardial adipose tissue, which is around heart, then mesenteric adipose tissue, which is uh, in between the gut. So it is in close proximity with a lot of important organisms, uh, sorry, organs, a lot of organs where it can influence their functions. Currently, there are three types of uh, adipose tissue which we have uh, identified. One is the major depots are white adipose tissue, which has a huge lipid uh, droplet and accumulates a lot of lipid, uh, but very few mitochondria and other cell organelles, but it is very active. Then, then there is a brown adipose tissue. It is brown because it has got large amount of bacteria, uh, large amount of uh, mitochondria. And then there is an intermediate one also called beige because of its color or bright, which has got intermediate number of mitochondria. So the mitochondria makes brown adipose tissue uh, regulate uh, body temperature and especially in cold. So it's mainly found in uh, mammals who uh, go hibernation, say for example, polar bears and bears and uh, other, uh, uh, even uh, rats have, uh, rats and mice have uh, lots of uh, brown adipose tissue. Until recently, people thought we don't have any brown adipose tissue left. Babies are born with the brown adipose tissue, that's why they don't shiver because they can generate heat using that brown adipose tissue. But over time, we lose it. Until recently. Then somebody was doing a scanning of thyroids, PET scan, and found these things lit up because of a cold temperature. And then they started thinking, what is it? And on further investigation, they found actually these are brown adipose tissue, which even adults have. And you won't be surprised that the most brown adipose tissue in humans in UK is found in people. Uh, who work on construction sites because they spend a lot of their time working in cold outside. So we did a project, a small project with the uh, Warwick Hospital. We were looking for cheap methods or a quick method of identifying uh, brown adipose tissue by MRI scan instead of doing a PET scan. So using uh, AI as well as the scanning technology, 
we have formed an algorithm which you apply with the image, then you can actually identify brown adipose tissue by MRI itself. So one school of thought is that if we have more brown adipose tissue and if we expressed uh, 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 increase the number of cells within our body, our metabolic rate will increase and we will lose weight naturally. If any of you are thinking the natural way of uh, increasing your brown adipose tissue is spending at least two hours below 19 degrees outside or having cold showers regularly. It's not been proven, but that's one of the thoughts. That's when it lights up because we put a cold jacket on these people before the scanning. <coughs> so as you think, as you may know that uh, by this time that adipose tissue was thought to be an organ or a tissue which just there accumulates lipid and does nothing. But suddenly whole perception changed. Adipose tissue is believed to secrete known to secrete more than 200 cytokines. They're also called adipokines. Adipose tissue itself, when in cellular forms, can be called lipocyte or adipocytes. And they, because of these cytokines or adipokines, they are able to influence most of the metabolic organs in the body, including brain, where they secrete leptin, which regulates our satiety or hunger. So uh, if you have you have less leptin, you are more likely to feel hungry more. Actually, there was a boy which uh, had leptin mutation. So he used to eat a lot. He was very active, but very obese, even though he was very active. And uh, uh, Sir Steve O'Reilly's group found that his leptin gene was mutated. And when they gave him leptin, actually he became very thin. So there are a lot of things uh, it can induce because of its adipokine roles. So this is uh, what uh, we are interested in. I'm interested in uh, uh, stem cells, uh, mainly adipose derived ones. So this is a type fat which we used to get, say, for example, for after a liposuction bucket full of them and then we'll spin them. You can isolate uh, normal adipocytes at that time itself and study on them, or you can further fraction them down into stromal vascular fraction or uh, adult stem cells and freeze them and use it later. They are quite uh, pluripotent. They can be converted into fat cells, obviously, a bone, a muscle, cartilage, uh, a skin, there are a lot of uh, companies now trying to produce a skin graft using this because almost everybody has extra adipose tissue. So one of the advantages we had at Warwick is its close proximity to the hospital. So every time uh, we... Oh, why it's not coming? It's a skipping a slide. I'm sorry. Anyway, I'll move on this one. So a normal adipose tissue looks like this. It has a big lipid droplet, and then it has got endoplasmic reticulum around it, and then a few mitochondria. The role of endoplasmic reticulum, which is my interest, is basically it uh, does protein synthesis. Uh, when, the, uh, when the RNA is uh, transcribed, ribosomes bind to it, and when the protein is translated, it comes to the endoplasmic reticulum, uh, and there, that's where it gets folded, modified, and most of the secretory proteins do pass through that, especially for uh, modifications. It, is also, it also stores calcium. And then mitochondria, mitochondria, as you know, is the powerhouse of the cell, which produces uh, energy. It is also involved in heat production, cellular metabolism, cell growth, and uh, cell death. So one of the biggest changes we see as soon as there is a nutrient access is the changes within endoplasmic reticulum and mitochondria. So my interest is mainly in uh, 
in both these cell organelles and how uh, they, if they don't work properly or there is a dysfunction in these two cell organelles due to uh, excess nutrition or low nutrition, uh, how it impacts metabolism. So there is a, this is the ER stress pathway. You see, it, 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 it gets switched on when there is in times of abundance or excess uh, nutrition, there is a demand of protein synthesis also increases. If the demand of protein synthesis increases, there is demand of protein folding and protein modification increases. Uh, in normal circumstances, ER is able to manage all that process, but under extreme cases, mainly uh, some of the factors uh, uh, understood are excess nutrition, uh, viral infection, uh, and uh, hypoxia, which may induce this process of ER stress. So what it immediately does is it switches on a, a response called unfolded protein response and switches uh, one of the pathways, say for example, will activate and shut down any protein synthesis within the cell. Another pathway will switch on uh, within the ER, which will actually switch on only the essential proteins which are required, those transcription factors for the survival of the cell. And the third pathway actually will switch on when everything has gone wrong and cell has no chance of survival. It will switch on the apoptotic pathway and kill the cell so that the bad thing does not affect. Uh, one of the uh, things which have we have uh, identified is that when the ER stress is massive in obesity, it also induces high inflammation, which could be the primary cause of insulin resistance. So this is uh, one of the slides where we measured the markers of ER stress in lean people and obese people. And as you can see, they have increased ER stress uh, obesity does cause increased ER stress. To understand whether if these subjects lost weight, will the ER stress will be reduced uh, and will their insulin sensitivity will be incre uh, increased. For that, then we collaborated with a group in Czech Republic who were doing regular bariatric surgery and they had collected samples before bariatric surgery and also six months after bariatric surgery with weight loss. And what we found that indeed, after bariatric surgery, ER stress does go down and these people do become uh, insulin sensitive. Similarly, we did a, a mitochondrial study where we investigated whether, where we investigated uh, whether the mitochondrial dynamics is affected or mitochondrial uh, structure is affected. And uh, we found that with, please ignore the number of figures on this slide, but this tells us that the mitochondrial dynamics where the mitochondria constantly divides or fuses to maintain mitochondrial health actually does improve after weight loss. Mitochondria, if you know, is mostly or almost 100% from mother. It does not come from father. So it does not have any sexual cycle to improve its health. So it has to constantly fuse and divide. In that way, it can maintain the mitochondrial health. The bad ones, when they divide, they get destroyed by the autophagy, while the good ones will live and then fuse and become bigger mitochondria and metabolic. That's why metabolic health and mitochondrial dynamics is key to understanding this. And then that's why we studied the mitochondrial morphology. And mitochondrial morphology, if you see here, what we did, we wanted to investigate whether ER stress also leads to mitochondrial dysfunction. So we induced artificially ER stress by using uh, one of the molecules called tunicomycin, which inhibits glycosylation or the protein modification. So as you can see, the mitochondrial fragmentation increase, uh, the swollen mitochondria increases, and also the mitochondrial number increases. Sometimes increase in mitochondrial number is good, 
but not always, especially if the mitochondrial number has increased due to mitochondrial fragmentation, which is totally undesirable. By this time, I was thinking, uh, uh, thinking about other avenues of research uh, in terms of uh, looking at drug targets and also disease prevention. And that's the time. I don't know. It just skipped the slide anyway. It's, it's, it's fine. And that happened when I came across one of the lectures delivered by uh, Dr. Ranjan Yaznik at uh, Warwick. And that day he opened my eyes that there are other stuff where you can investigate. And he was looking at vitamin B12. So what he showed, he's been working for 30, 40 years within uh, with the tribal population in, in India near Pune. And what he found, he looked at the mothers at uh, a, the age of pregnancy, during pregnancy, and followed up their children as well. And what he found that B12 deficiency, the mothers who had lower level of the uh, of the guidance which says B12 deficiency is there, the mothers who had B12 deficiency, their children actually developed insulin resistance as early as, or showing signs of, as early as six years of age. So, so after his uh, uh, talk, I uh, started discussing with another co uh, colleague, Dr. Serverin from uh, NHS, and who was also interested in uh, vitamin B12 and its uh, deficiencies. So what Ranjan told me that, yes, I have got all this hypothesis and beautiful data to show that insulin resistance happens, but I have no proof or no mechanism to show why it is happening. So I said, OK, we'll investigate uh, this in the UK population. So we chose two population in uh, women of childbearing age. One was UK population with uh, 315. And then we chose another population in Saudi Arabia with King Saudi University. And I was surprised uh, to see that actually these women who had B12 deficiency had higher cholesterol, higher BMI higher triglycerides and higher homocysteine, all those things indicating towards metabolic syndrome. Then we further investigated uh, in Europeans and Indian populations living in Europe. And what we found that uh, that was in Caucasian as well as uh, South Asian origin populations. Again, we found that if you had a low B12 or B12 deficiency, you're more likely to have high triglycerides and high cholesterol in your circulation. Then we looked at the mothers who had uh, 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 given birth and looked at their B12 profile and then looked at the uh, uh, factors, uh, uh, metabolic syndrome factors within the babies. And we found that the mothers who had B12 deficiency, their babies or the neonates had higher triglycerides, higher HOMA IR, which is a, an indicator of insulin resistance. They had low HDL, which is good cholesterol, high homocysteine, and high leptin as well. So I, I, I was quite uh, interested. So, so far, what I had seen was the B12 deficiency is, is quite uh, broad, as well as it's quite uh, significant, as it causes homocysteine increase, which has always been linked with increased cardiovascular risk. So I went back and looked at the pathway. B12 actually plays an important role in DNA and RNA synthesis through its one carbon metabolism. And one key react reaction where it is uh, acts as a cofactor is the methionine synthase, conversion of homocysteine in methionine. So naturally, if there was low B12, you will have increased homocysteine and less methionine. What methionine also does is converts into s adenosyl methionine, which is the donor of methyl group to DNA, protein, and RNA for their modifications or methylation process. It also has a role as cofactor uh, in the conversion of succinyl COA, which is 
uh, used in the Krebs cycle for ATP generation. And the uh, because of its deficiency, MMA is an inhibitor of beta oxidation, so fatty acid oxidation, which leads to then lipid accumulation within the body. So <clears throat> to study that, I uh, designed several experiments on a, a primary adipocyte model and uh, 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 it started with 12 conditions, but settled down with just three because it was just going out of hand. So we had a condition of control, which has optimum uh, B12 level in the cell culture media, then low and a condition where there was no B12 at all. And what we found was that when there is a B12 deficiency or low B12, the, then again, there was increased cholesterol and homocysteine within the system itself. Then we did a microarray uh, uh, study from these samples. And what we found, there were significant changes in low B12 and no B12 conditions at the genes are totally uh, either highly expressed or or, or, or have a lower expression compared to control. And to sur my surprise, the pathways which came up with a significantly modified was cholesterol biosynthesis and unfolded protein response, which is ER stress pathway. And these are the some of the genes which were uh, included in B cholesterol biosynthesis. So I looked at the expression of these biosynthesis genes and we found that Indeed, these genes were highly expressed in uh, low B12 or B12 deficiency conditions. The cholesterol, the way it is regulated is that once the cell senses uh, there is a, a low cholesterol within the cell, which is an essential molecule for survival of the cell, this uh, SREPP molecule translocates to nucleus and targets these genes, which uh, regulate either regulate cholesterol or synthesize cholesterol. So we looked at these regulatory genes as well, and they were highly expressed whenever there was B12 deficiency. So it was quite clear that B12 deficiency leads to upregulation of cholesterol biosynthesis. So what was the actual mechanism? So as uh, we explored for, uh, earlier I, during the pathway that whenever there is a B12 deficiency, uh, there is a reduced methylation potential. And what we found is that after a whole genome-wide methylation study, we found that when there is B12 deficiency, there is a genome-wide methylation low, low methylation uh, within the all, all the genes. And cholesterol regulatory genes such as SREBF1 and LDLR actually have uh, CPG islands which have low methylation that makes them open for higher transcription. You, you can ignore the rest of the picture, basically. <laughs> so, we wanted to investigate whether this is actually happened in mothers which have undergone pregnancy. So what we did was actually we collected adipose tissue from mothers who were undergoing cesarean section. And we formed two groups, mothers who were into B12 deficient category and mothers who had uh, higher uh, B12 or B12 sufficient category. And in that adipose tissue, then we measured the uh, cholesterol biosynthesis as well as regulatory genes. And we found indeed when you had B12 deficiency, these genes were expressed. And that's why these mothers had high cholesterol. And also those babies during pregnancy were exposed to higher cholesterol as well. So they are at a more high likely risk of developing metabolic syndrome when they grow up. That's why maternal nutrition is so important. Another thing which I have uh, uh, taken is the insulin resistance. Insulin resistance, the way it works is when you eat something, insulin is produced by beta cells and most of the cells such as adipose cells and skeletal muscles, they have insulin receptor. So insulin binds, and then through various signaling, it activates GLUT4 vesicles to the cell surface. Once the GLUT4 vesicles comes to the cell surface, then they bind to the glucose and internalize it for energy production. So it's a simple pathway. What happens in insulin resistance is you may have a lot of insulin in circulation, but something in this 
circulation goes wrong in this uh, pathway, that can lead to GLUT4 not moving to the cell surface. And if that happens, then glucose stays in circulation and causes all kinds of secondary effects like cardiovascular disease and arterial defects and all those things. So we did investigate in B12 deficiency conditions. Actually, the cells were compromised uh, with the B12 uh, 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 intake. So here, suppose for in this graph, you can see uh, this is the control. When you add insulin, you the cells are taking more glucose, but they're already compromised here. So And even if you add insulin, the cells are unable to take uh, glucose, internalized glucose, and they hence can't metabolize it. And then we pinpointed that one of the key uh, kinases are the enzymes, which uh, activates GLUT4 for translocation to the cell membrane was downregulated. And why that enzyme was downregulated was there were two proteins. One is phosphatase, which stops the activation of AKT, and another one, TRIP3, which directly binds to AKT. So once they are activated, they stop that AKT to mobilize the GLUT4 to the cell surface. So, in so if you think from drugs point of view, these two becomes a good target for, for drug discovery. As you will see in, in this slide, that when I inhibit these two proteins by siRNA technology or drug technology, the insulin uptake almost reaches to the normal control levels. <clears throat> this is a slide where which shows in real time when this is the cell which is insulin resistant uh, because of P10. And you can see these green dots are GLUT4 vesicle within the cell. The blue one is, a, is nucleus. When I inhibit P10 with a drug or siRNA, you can see these GLUT4 moving to the cell surface. So that shows that uh, it has started functioning and now it has become insulin sensitive. So, so far what we have seen is vitamin B12 deficiency is, can cause abnormal gene expression. It can also cause hyperhomocysteinemia. It can cause insulin resistance. It can cause adipose tissue dysfunction and hence metabolic syndrome, not only in the person who is going through, but also in future generation. And that's why the message is to put uh, mothers on a proper diet so that their future generation is uh, at a less risk of uh, metabolic. This is just one of the factors. There are multiple factors which could be studied this way uh, to uh, find uh, treatments. Just, uh, just a couple of slides uh, more. Uh, this is one of the interesting uh, patients which we encountered in the clinic. This is a female 19 years who is metabolically active and healthy and has a mutation of WIN10B. This is a gene which uh, actually uh, inhibits adipogenesis. Even though she is metabolically active, her BMI is 62. It is higher than any bariatric surgery patients, and her weight was 143.2. At the age of 19, she it was still metabolically active. So what we did, we uh, do, uh, took a adipose tissue sample from her and cultured it. So compared to lean, her adipose tissue, they just accumulate large amount of uh, lipids. Actually, adipose tissue, if it kept doing its role properly of accumulating lipids and lysing it when required, there is no issue. The issue is when it does not function properly because of several other reasons or other factors. So this is the pathway for uh, adipogenesis, which is uh, regulated by VIN10B. So in her, because VIN10B is off, all these transcription factors which promote adipogenesis are switched on. That's the main reason for obesity. And that also is the reason why we should not treat every patient same. 
because normally if we won't have investigated it further, we won't know that why she is obese and probably she would have had to go through multiple liposuctions or uh, bariatric surgery and uh, all, all that uh, uh, unnecessary steps. So coming to personalized medicine, we have been very lucky to acquire this funding to create a facility for omics research and metabolism at University of Derby through local enterprise partnership funding, as well as uh, funding from Derby University, which have made equal contributions. So total funding is around 1.7 million. Now we are in a great position to investigate not just genetic, but also environmental factor and any other factor which may be leading to metabolic diseases in humans. Now we are in a position to investigate the whole genome, also the transcriptome, the, all the RNA, which is overexpressed under disease condition. We can investigate all the protein molecules and also all the metabolites produced either in pathogenic conditions or in a, any other pathology or, a, 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 or, or something good. We can also look at the impact of various nutrients with this, faci uh, with this facility. So why personalized me medicine? Because we are all different. If you think, uh, Winston Churchill lived at a ripe age of 90, and he was, most of his life, he was overweight, he drank, he smoked, exercised, and he never exercised, and he wasn't known to have a healthy diet. Yet he was reasonably okay and lived a healthy life. And there, on the other hand, we have uh, uh, Jim Fix, who wrote a book on complete book of running, and you would be surprised to know he died of heart attack while running at a, an early age of 52. That's why it's very important because of some conditions where he was genetically predisposed for uh, cardiac disease uh, or something equivalent. So that's why it is important to treat every patient on the causes of the disease rather than uh, uh, treating them universally like we do. I have worked with a lot of people and it is impossible to acknowledge everyone, but some of them in the past 10 years who have made significant contributions are listed here and some of them might be listening to this talk. Uh, so thank you everybody for uh, your contribution and uh, in my research and for uh, continued uh, collaboration. If I acknowledged everyone, it will be longer than the Avengers film uh, tribute, which goes on for more than six minutes. Finally, thank, thank you. And I would like to show my personal gratitude to my parents, my father, who was airman in Air Force, uh, and my mother, who never had the opportunity to go to school herself, but made sure all her children were educated to the highest level possible. Secondly, I would like to thank my eldest brother, who kept me on track uh, with his uh, constant advice during my studies, during maths, as well as he supported my any shortfall in funding while I was doing graduation studies. And then finally, I would like to thank my great uncle, my uh, grandfather's younger brother, who uh, had uh, the way I think, the way I do things has a lot to do with what he taught me during my early summer vacations, which was spent like three, four day hours every day with him. So thank you very much. <laughs>